Our scripture today is from the book of James, chapter 4, verses 13 through 15. Now listen, you who say, today or tomorrow, we'll go to this or that city, spend a year there, carrying on business and make money. Why do you not even know what will happen tomorrow? What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if it's the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. Thank you, Charlie. So happy to have Cheryl back with us and also the Scott family. It's so nice to have you folks here today. That's a powerful passage, isn't it? Really causes you to think. Garth Brooks, a number of years ago, had a hit called, If Tomorrow Never Comes. Would you bow with me in prayer? Holy Father in heaven, help us to be sober and serious about our lives and how fragile we are. Help us to recognize, dear Lord, that we have no idea when we will give up our spirit and return to the dust from whence we came. Help us, dear God, to recognize that each day should be looked upon as our last day and that we should please you in everything that we do. Help us to learn from this passage of Scripture and help us to put it into practice in our daily lives. In Jesus' name, amen. I'd like to read the lyrics of this song. The sentiments, of course, I think are very, very biblical. And although it's not a religious song, it's a country song, country music song, I think that it's would be a good way to enter into our lesson today. Sometimes late at night, I lie awake and watch her sleeping. She's lost in peaceful dreams, so I turn out the lights and lay there in the dark. And the thought crosses my mind, if I never wake up in the morning, would she ever doubt the way I feel about her in my heart? If tomorrow never comes, will she know how much I loved her? Did I try in every way to show her every day that she's my only one? And if my time on earth were through and she must face this world without me, is the love I gave her in the past going to be enough to last if tomorrow never comes? Because I've lost loved ones in my life who never knew how much I loved them. Now I live with regret that my true feelings for them never were revealed. So I made a promise to myself to say each day how much she means to me and avoid that circumstance where there's no second chance to tell her how I feel. If tomorrow never comes, will she know how much I loved her? Did I try in every way to show her every day that she's my only one and if my time on earth were through and she must face this world without me, is the love I gave her in the past going to be enough to last if tomorrow never comes? So tell someone that you love just what you're thinking of if tomorrow never comes. That song should include a verse on our relationship with our Lord. Because 
God has manifested his love to us and we are deeply loved by him and he needs to know how much we love him as well. It happens. The day doesn't come. No tomorrows. It reads like the morning news. A couple's oldest son kills his brother in a fit of jealousy. A mother sends her son away for his own protection, but she dies never to see him again. A woman gives her husband a beautiful son, but she dies in childbirth. A father receives word that his son fell in battle. A mother watches her innocent son executed for a crime he did not commit. A man stands up for what he believes and is murdered by a mob. A storm demolishes a house and kills a decent couple's grown children who had gathered to celebrate one of their birthdays, seven sons and three daughters. Sounds like the evening news. Yes, but actually these tragedies come from the pages of the Holy Bible. Yes, but actually these tragedies are there for a reason. The Bible does not sidestep the stark reality of living and dying. It records the lives of those that lived to a ripe old age, a good old age, and those who were cut down in the flower of their youth. Nothing escapes its notice in the stark realities of life. So why do you suppose God wanted a book to read like the morning news in the record of human existence? Well, in the first place, I think that the Lord wants us to know that life is from a human point of view, very unpredictable. In Robert uh, Burns' poem, To a Mouse, in 1786, he tells how he was plowing a field and uprooted a mouse's nest. And the resulting poem is an apology to the mouse, and from it came the saying, the best laid plans of mice and men often go awry. And, of course, the classic modern novel to reflect this was John Steinbeck's uh, novel, Mice and Men. But the Bible talks about this as well in Luke 12, 16 through 21. And he told them a parable, saying, The land of a rich man was very productive. And he began reasoning to himself, saying, What shall I do, since I have no place to store all my crops? Then he said, this is what I will do. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones, and there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have many goods laid up for many years to come. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your soul is required of you. And now who will own what you have gathered together? So is the man who stores up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. We sing the song, time is filled with swift transition, not of earth unmoved can stand. You see, nothing stays the same. Have you noticed at a high school reunion how old those fellow students have gotten? And we think that we, we only have not changed. Hosea 7 and verse 9 uh, the prophet refers to the self-deceived lives of the Jewish people who thought that they were okay with God, but because of their idolatry and their paganism, they did not realize that they had lost their relationship with God. And he says here in this verse, Strangers have devoured his strength, and he knoweth it not. Yea, gray hairs are here and there upon him, yet he knoweth it not. And so... The Lord wants us to be a little realistic about life in general, that nothing stays the same, and it's very unpredictable. As James chapter 4, 13 through 15 says, you do not know what will be on the morrow. And here we are just like a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. Now, there is an amazing thought that goes into that word vanish away is talking about our dying 
And so he wants us to realize that bad things happen to good people. These are Christians that James is writing to. And he's saying, look, don't be overconfident that everything is fine just because you look good, you feel good, and everything's going fine. You just don't know it. I'm a perfect example of that, that I thought I was in excellent health, and I found out that one of my arteries in my heart was 99% blocked, and it was called the widow maker for a reason. And had I not been doing my due diligence, I probably would not be standing up here today. And so bad things do happen to good people, and some people think that they have perfect health, but they do not know that for a fact. Now, <clears throat> Luke 13 speaks clearly about this in verses 1 through 5. Now, on the same occasion, there was some present who reported to him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. Can you imagine this? You're going to the temple and you're worshiping God and, and the governor brings soldiers down on horses and just slaughter you right in the midst of your worship? What about all those 18 churches that were attacked by fanatics who sought to come in there and, and, and increase the, as, as many fatalities as possible? These people worshiping God, thinking everything is fine, then all of a sudden some madman comes in and starts shooting? That will rock your faith, and Jesus is addressing it right here. He says, do you suppose that these Galileans were greater sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered like this? I tell you, no, but unless you repent, you will perish. Or do you suppose that those 18 on whom the Tower of Siloam fell and killed them were worse culprits than all the men who live in Jerusalem? I tell you, no, but except you repent, you will also perish. You know, if we become Christians to avoid bad things happening to us, we are going to be sadly mistaken. Many years ago, in the 80s, I baptized a young man by the name of Stuart. Well, uh, I say he's a young man. He was in his 40s. At my age, that's young. Okay? And he was doing fine for a while. He was a single guy. And um, he, he had been divorced. His daughter was living with his mother. And things seemed to be pretty good for a while. Then all of a sudden the wheels come off. He lost his job and uh, his daughter no longer wanted to see him. And, and it just one thing after another happened to him. But nothing really happened to his health. Uh, but everything around him. And he told me that, you know, Rob, before I became a Christian, I didn't have all these problems. It was only after he became a Christian that I started having all these problems. Well, he obviously forgot about what happened to his marriage and his family. Uh, I guess that didn't stick with him very much. But he was so convinced that being a Christian caused all these things that he gave up his faith. He left the church, abandoned his faith. You know, the scriptures are very clear. In Acts 14 and 22, with many tribulations, we are to enter into the kingdom of God. In 2 Timothy 3 and verse 12, it says very clearly that all that live righteous shall suffer persecution. You know, and so we have it very clear here that we are going to pay a price for being a Christian. It's a given. In 1 Peter 5 and verse 8, we find that Christians have a target on their back and the one who is trying to attack the Christian is nothing less than the devil himself. Be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, walks about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. In Ephesians 6.12, Paul says, Our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the forces, world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces 
of wickedness in the heavenly places. So why wouldn't Stuart have it a little harder than before when actually the problem is Satan was attacking him and he's going to attack you and he's going to attack me and he's going to find the Achilles heel. He's going to find the kink in our armor and he's going to attack us there. And so we must recognize that we don't have any promise of tomorrow to win that fight. The victory must be ours today. And besides, you know, pain might be so excruciating to the body that one cannot handle it. If a person has to be put out to escape the pain, at least thank God he may be put out. But we all know that without pain signaling that something is wrong and needs attention, most of us would not be here today. Pain is the reason why we are here today. The reason why diabetics often lose their feet is because neuropathy destroys the nerves that tell them that something is bad going on. And if there's an infection because of a cut, whatever, he does not feel it, and it might get infected, and it might get out of control, and that person's life is only saved by amputation. And so we value pain because it tells us that something is wrong that needs fixed. Well, what about the pain of our consciences? You know, a psychopath or a sociopath feels no guilt. Now, the sociopath may feel a little bit, but not enough to change his lifestyle, to do away with his sinful behavior. But a psychopath has no conscience whatsoever. Therefore, he's capable of doing all kinds of atrocities and evils and never worry about that. Now, Christians have to be concerned, according to 1 Timothy chapter 4, that our consciences are not seared. And what that means is that every person living can live in such a way that they can destroy the sensitive conscience that tells them that something isn't right. And so you and I have the capacity to feel pain in our hearts, in our consciences. And God's created us that way so that we can sense something is wrong. The world says, hey, ignore guilt, deny guilt. The fact of the matter is you keep denying guilt and what happens is you're searing your conscience and you can do things that you would not do otherwise. But the pain of conscience is saying, take care of me. I'm hurting. I'm suffering pain. Fix it. You see, God wants us to number our days and get a heart of wisdom. Psalm 90 and verse 12. So teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. In Ephesians 5.16, the old translation says, redeem the time because the days are evil. For years and years, I couldn't understand that at all. Redeem the time? How can you buy back time that's already passed? Well, basically, as the new translation says, make the most of the time. But the idea in that translation is also, I think, missed. The idea is rescue our time from waste. Take possession of the time you have because the days are evil. Because life may be taken from you. Time is precious. And take advantage of every moment. Use the time wisely. In 2 Corinthians 13 and 5, Paul says this. To Christians, test yourselves to see if you are in the faith, examine yourselves, or do you not recognize this about yourselves, that Jesus Christ is in you unless indeed you fail the test? In Galatians 6 and verse 10, as we have opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially the household of faith. Solomon says in Ecclesiastes 9 and verse 10, whatever 
your hand finds to do, do it with all your might, for there is no work, nor device, nor knowledge, nor wisdom in the grave where you are going. Because today could be the last day of our lives. I should try with all my power and my strength to serve the Lord in the best way possible according to my opportunities and my abilities. In the 1880s, William Taylor, a widely known uh, preacher in America at the time, went to England to visit his dear preacher friend who had been ill for a couple years and would soon die. While visiting him, his daughter read him a beautiful poem written by the ailing preacher's friend who had been kept from the ministry because of a lifelong physical uh, ailment. And she shared the poem with Taylor because it indicated her father's feelings under this trial. And since it may be of value to some of you, I will share it with you here. I am not sent a pilgrim here, my heart with earth to fill. But I am here God's grace and serve God's sovereign will. He leads me on through smiles and tears, grief follows gladness still, but let me welcome both alike, since both work out as will. The strong man's strength to toil for Christ, the fervent preacher's skill I sometimes wish, but better far to be just what God will. I know not how this languid life may life's vast ends fulfill. He knows, and that life is not lost, that answers best as will. No service in itself is small, none great though earth it fill, but if that is small that seeks its own, and great that seeks God's will. Then hold my hand, most gracious Lord, and guide all my going still, and let this be my life's one aim, to do and bear thy will. The Lord uses the brevity of life to teach us to reach the lost. If you cannot sing like angels, if you cannot preach like Paul, you can tell the love of Jesus, you can say he died for all. If you cannot cross the ocean and the heathen land explore, you can find one just next door. Did you know 151,600 people die daily, according to the last uh, poll in 2011? That's 6,316 each hour. That's 105 each minute and nearly two every second. There's a lot of people that are going into eternity unprepared to meet their God. I've handled probably around 500 funerals in my many years of ministry. Those who passed were from all walks of life. From infants to those over 100. Those who died, died of natural causes, suicide, murder, accident. A preacher friend of mine who passed away a few years ago preached 10 miles from where I preached in the 60s. He told me a story that haunted him for years. He had given up on his sister's, uh, on a sister's husband who kept turning him down when he asked him to study with him. So he stopped asking, and a few years passed by, and then one day he got a call. The man said he wanted to study with him and learn about Jesus and possibly be baptized. The night that they were going to meet, he was killed in an automobile accident. And Doug always said, why did I stop reaching out to him? Why, why, why? Now, in those situations, uh, I don't think we can pass judgment. He's in the hands of a just and merciful God. But I don't think we would want to live with such doubt. There must be the sense of urgency. The Great Commission says, go ye, and that means go me. And we would like to suggest that every non-believer is a mission field and every Christian is a missionary. And I guess you might say I have a very uh, morbid interest in old cemeteries, especially those of the 1800s and early 1900s. Even with all our medical advances, today gravestones still record the fact that many die too young. And there are those that live very long years, even back then. I officiated the death of three little children 
along with their mother, who was brutally murdered by their father, who forced his sons to help him hide the bodies. You know, there's a book written called Must the Young Die Too? The tragedy is they do. And I find it interesting that most who died and was raised according to the Bible were young people. I believe Lazarus was a young man since he was living with his sisters. Their parents probably were dead, which indicates they too died much too young. When God wants us to do, what God wants us to do is to put quality in our days, which means that we would put quality in minutes, days, months, and years, and decades, and that we'll use all that as opportunities to become what God wants us to be and do what he wants us to do. Methuselah lived 969 years. That's 353,685 days. Jesus lived 33 and a half years. That's just 12,227 and a half days. Methuselah lived 30 times longer than Jesus. Yet, what was said of Methuselah? I've shared this with you before. You would think that a man that lived almost a thousand years, there would be amazing accomplishments that would be shared for generations to come. But no, there's not one positive thing other than this. He fathered children. Methuselah lived almost a thousand years, and the only thing that is recorded is that he fathered children? And then you look at Jesus. All the libraries of the world could not contain the books that could be written by, about him. As a matter of fact, in the Library of Congress, there is recorded there that more volumes have been written about Jesus than all the greats that have ever lived. And yet he was a young man. When he died. It isn't how long you live, but it's how you live that makes the difference. So if you died tonight, do you know without a doubt that you would go to heaven? If there's any doubt, Paul says, test yourselves. Examine whether you're not in the faith. And so as you get up every morning, you have to look at yourself in the mirror. If you're like me, you don't want to look at yourself in the mirror. But the fact of the matter is that we have to look at ourselves and see uh, ourselves as we really are. And are we following James chapter 4 and say every morning, If the Lord wills, I will do this or that. Two things will happen. It will motivate us to put quality in that day of doing good for others and winning a victory over a temptation or a trial or a difficulty. And it's reaching out to help and assist others to do the same. And so if tomorrow never comes, where will you spend eternity? If there's some things that you need to resolve, take care of them as soon as possible. If you need to repent, repent right now. If you need to manifest your faith in Jesus Christ and be baptized, be baptized today. If you need the Lord Jesus, will you not accept him in your heart at this time? If you need to respond for any reason, share that need right now as together we stand and as we sing. There's a land that is fair and